Good evening and welcome to this, the final instalment of the Mountford Chambers Autumn Seminar Programme. Uh, tonight, we discuss our 10 top tips for practitioners dealing with fitness to practice proceedings before various healthcare regulators. And along the way, we intend to look at some of the case law developments uh, over the last few months. Uh, my name is James Lloyd. I am the deputy head of the Mountford Chambers Regulatory and Professional Discipline Practice Group, and I'm joined tonight by five other members of our team. Between us, our work covers, I think, all of the major healthcare regulators, both in the capacity as case presenting and for the defence. It won't surprise, to, uh, surprise you to learn that uh, our members act in fitness to practice proceedings across all of those regulators and at all stage and stages of the process, from uh, investigations to interim orders, final hearings, reviews, high court extensions and appeals. Before we start, uh, a few Zoom housekeeping points, if I may. Uh, we ask that all participants mute themselves uh, during the presentation, uh, but of course feel free to ask questions uh, whenever they come up uh, and to use the chat function uh, on Zoom as well. Uh, this presentation will be recorded uh, and the recording will be put online uh, sometime next week. Uh, we don't intend to take up much of your Thursday evening. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll aim to take around 45 minutes, and that's 15 minutes or so per topic area. Uh, we'll start with interim orders, uh, then we'll look at preparation for a final hearing, uh, and then the final hearing itself. Uh, and with that, I shall hand over uh, to Silas Lee for the first of those topics. Um, good evening. Thank you. As James has just said, we're going to address you first on the issue of interim orders. Um, I will refer to three recent appeal decisions and draw out some of the key themes that emerge, um, with particular reference to the benefits of honing in on and taking a targeted approach to concerns raised by regulators at the interim order stage. And then James will take over from me and he'll provide some of his top tips for preparing for and responding to interim order applications. Um, so the first of the three cases that I wanted to um, look at is the case of Dr. MXM and GMC. It's a case that's been referred to in, in um, the Mountford case update and indeed by other chambers. Um, it involved allegations of sexual misconduct. Uh, the doctor having had an affair with somebody um, who was a patient of his, uh, but crucially, where the relationship itself had commenced independently of his role as a, as a doctor. Uh, the GMC had sought conditions of practice, um, but despite the GMC's position, the tribunal imposed an 18-month interim suspension. And in this case, uh, the need for the panel to state clear reasons for the imposition of an interim order was emphasised. The appeal court found the tribunal's reasoning to be thin, and in particular, there was a lack of reasoning as to why suspension was necessary over and above uh, simple conditions of practice. Um, it's, it's clear to see why in that particular case that there was criticism of the failure to give reasons. Um, however, I think it's fair to say um, that any decision that doesn't sufficiently address the necessity of the order, uh, the proportionality of any particular terms or of suspension, and the reasons for its length may, may be open to challenge. And that's something that both regulators and, and those representing professionals are, are um, alive to. Uh, that particular case, um, in my opinion, it's a reminder of the need to properly distinguish between different types of regulatory concerns. Um, in, in many cases, there will be some concerns that relate squarely to public protection, um, there will be some that relate only to uh, public confidence in the professions, and there'll be other concerns where there's no risk really in respect of either of those grounds. Uh, and um, in my view, it, it's highly desirable whether you're case presenting, uh, but particularly for those representing regulated professionals, um, to draw a, a very clear line in the sand between those different groups of concerns. And that way, 
panels can be encouraged to focus only on the parts of the case that really call for a substantive response at, at the interim order stage, rather than dealing with them all as, as an undifferentiated mass. Um, so practically speaking, um, if individual concerns can be, say, matched up with specific proposed conditions, and if that can be accompanied with an explanation as to why those conditions ameliorate those specific concerns or groups of concerns, um, we think that's likely to be the basis for, for particularly strong submissions. Uh, and that's especially the case where inter interim suspension is um, on the cards, so to speak. Um, it, it applies equally where a regulator is concerned to seek suspension, highlighting which of the concerns specifically merit suspension will be of assistance to panels. Um, but where submissions can also be made on the workability or not of any condition sought, and where that can be accompanied by evidence, um, we're of the, of the opinion that it's likely to stand out to panels uh, if it's presented in that way and to be highly persuasive. Um, and that's something that I, I know James will comment um, further on, on what work can be done ahead of a hearing to tee up those sorts of submissions. Um, uh, so that, that deals with the first case that I, I wanted to draw to your attention. Um, the second is that of K uh, and GMC. Um, in that case, an interim suspension again had been imposed um, it was opposed initially ahead of a doctor's trial for rape. Um, that doctor was then acquitted uh, at trial. Uh, and following that, the tribunal varied the order to one of interim conditions. Uh, and they only imposed standard conditions on public interest grounds that the doctor notify the GMC of, of his various employment details and so on, uh, as well as to disclose the interim conditions themselves to the employer. Um, there weren't any further conditions beyond uh, that type. Um, the order was subsequently extended. That decision was successfully appealed. Uh, the appeal court were unable to identify any connection between the public interest and the actual conditions that had been imposed. Uh, the alleged rape wasn't said to have occurred in a clinical context, and the conditions were causing difficulty in the doctor returning to practice and so on that basis, the interim conditions were found to be both unnecessary and, uh, and disproportionate. Um, it, it's important, uh, we say, that panels don't fall into the trap of imposing something um, or, or, or just anything, simply because the case appears to be a serious one, uh, as appeared to happen in, in the case of Kay. Um, the final case is that of the NMC and MM. Um, that decision, like in the previous case, involved the imp imposition of interim suspension on public interest grounds alone. Uh, and in that case, sorry, in this case, um, there have been two separate referrals. The first related to the registrant working unrestricted, despite DBS having barred him from working with children and vulnerable adults. Um, that referral was plainly related to the registrant's working practice. Um, but the registrant was also subsequently referred a second time. Um, and that second referral related to his alleged failure to notify the NMC um, of a caution he had received in 2014, uh, a separate driving conviction, and the fact that he was being prosecuted for rape. So there were those two referrals uh, that ran side by side. And it was significant in that case that the link between those matters and the safety of the registrant's practice was much weaker in the second referral um, than it was in the first. Um, he was initially suspended. Um, that decision was made while both referrals were being dealt with. Um, however, the, the important point here really um, is that for the first referral, the one that related to him being barred from working with children and vulnerable adults, um, that case was discontinued by the regulator um, following a finding that there was no case to answer. But nevertheless, the committee confirmed the suspension order and the court were critical of that decision. And the important part really of that decision for these purposes um, is their finding that there must be a clear causal link between the risks to the public and the conduct of the registrant uh, 
um, or, or, or to clearly show why a suspension is necessary in the public interest. And in that case, it was noted that there didn't seem to be anything beyond the facts of the allegations themselves once that first referral had fallen away. Um, so that final case, again, it's a good example of the importance of drawing panel's attention uh, to the specifics of the concerns raised and what actual risks they raise. Um, so just in summary, then, um, for those representing regulators or, or regulated professionals, in many cases, it will assist to hone in on the individual concerns rather than taking them um, all together. And when making submissions on those individual concerns, highlight um, the clear causal link between the risk to public protection or public interest and the proposed conditions um, or indeed suspension. And on that, I will hand over to James. Thank you, Silas. Uh, as Silas has said, the last few months uh, have seen an increased amount of scrutiny by the High Court uh, of interim orders. Uh, and the High Court now seems to be taking uh, a much more uh, in-depth analysis uh, where regulators are suggesting that interim orders particularly uh, should be extended. There are, we suspect, a number of challenges in the pipeline uh, to interim orders. And now is a good time for us as practitioners to consider carefully the way in which we approach interim orders. And so here are our top 10 tips. Number one is to always think IO. Necessarily, when cases are reported to regulators and concerns raised, there can be a sense of rush or of urgency. And in some cases that is justified. Some cases will raise concerns about patient safety or service user safety, and, and regulators will rightly continue to act quickly. Sometimes that means there's not a lot of time to prepare. But in other cases, it is in fact quite obvious that when a regulator is going to seek an interim order. Concerns raised at a local level can often give us a clue as to whether or not an interim order will be sought. And so early engagement with clients is, in our view, of particular importance. Whenever a concern is reported to a regulator, even if you're only at a questioning or investigation stage prior to fitness to practice proceedings being brought, that one should prepare for the IO eventuality. Take instructions on the registrant or registered professionals working arrangements and how flexible those are. And also, from the outset, understand the process of the fitness to practice proceedings and understand where it is that the regulator's concerns are likely to lie. Our second tip ties into that, which is early engagement. It is very common to attend interim order applications and to be faced with little, if any, substantive information about the alleged conduct. It's very common for the bare bones to be presented to a panel only, along with sweeping assertions that particular conduct is dangerous or shows dishonesty or a propensity for particular types of misconduct. There are better ways of going about interim order applications, both from the perspective of the regulator and the regulated. We consider that proper engagement before an IO application is made between the regulator, the registrant, and those representing them uh, can alleviate some of the difficulties faced by panels uh, when they have these emergency applications before them. But not only that, proper engagement on behalf of registered professionals with those uh, whom they work, uh, with whom they work, uh, can, in our experience, make a huge amount of difference in the process. And so when faced with a healthcare professional, if defending, who you know will face fitness to practice proceedings, it is often useful to engage with their, supervi their, their supervisors, their line managers, before those proceedings are issued, to ensure that when that time comes and the emergency application is made, the best submissions and the most evidence can be provided on behalf of that registrant. Tip number three uh, is 
more focused on the types of interim orders that are often imposed. And our tip is to think different. All of the healthcare regulators have conditioned banks um, by various names, uh, lists of potential conditions of practice, which panels can pick from. That is not an exclusive menu. And in our experience, the best way to approach an interim order application, if, for example, a regulator is toying with the idea of interim suspension, is to think very carefully about the precise concerns in the case. Are there conditions of practice which can alleviate those concerns? Can the regulated professional be taken outside of a particular environment, away from risk factors? Can supervision be imposed which might alleviate any risks? The specific concerns have to be the starting point, and the regulator is under an obligation to give sufficient detail to ensure that the registrant understands the case as is currently uh, against them. So think what, how, when and who. There are a number of conditions which we believe can be imposed in most cases of supervision, uh, reg regulated uh, and regulator uh, supervised reflection. Uh, and conditions akin to reporting, which are grossly underused. Tip number four, uh, using time wisely. The reality of fitness to practice proceedings at the moment is that they take an awfully long time. Uh, interim orders of 18 months or more are, are very common and registered professionals facing complex allegations uh, can we wait uh, up to three years uh, before having their hearing uh, and having the chance to clear their name or indeed to answer those allegations. Uh, that time is not to be wasted uh, and conditions of practice can in fact be used by the defence uh, to ensure a better outcome at the end of the process if a professional is found to be impaired. Conditions of practice are not just there uh, to safeguard particular risks. Uh, the uh, enterprising defence practitioner can use them to uh, create an audit trail of mitigation for the final hearing. Conditions of practice requiring specific remedial steps, uh, training, training logs, uh, supervision, can all be used later on in the process uh, to, uh, to make a suggestion that there is no risk of repetition. In our experience, uh, those facing the most serious allegations can often mitigate their position significantly by using the time they have wisely before the final hearing. Tip number five, proportionality. Uh, anyone who has attended a fitness to practice hearing uh, in recent times will have heard the word proportionality bandied around uh, and in our experience uh, too little consideration is given to what that actually means uh, and how proportionality in terms of the imposition of an interim order uh, should be treated. Defence practitioners and regulators alike should consider carefully the consequences uh, of the misconduct in the particular case because it is the, the consequences and the risks which must be weighed against any restriction of practice. Defence practitioners uh, should, in our view, uh, and often don't, uh, try to furnish panels at interim order stages with evidence of the impact of restrictions of practice, financial evidence, uh, evidence of um, particular registrants' income, the impact that losing their job on a temporary basis would have, the impact on others. Uh, without the, that information, panels cannot properly weigh up uh, as they are indeed required to in the proportionality test. And again, this is one area where as defence practitioners, uh, we can, uh, in our experience, do better uh, and provide further evidence. Uh, tip number six, almost on a theme, uh, time is the theme. Uh, we know, uh, and indeed regulators know, that often fitness to practice proceedings come out of the blue for registrants 
or indeed funding difficulties mean that uh, those representing them are often brought in at last minute. But a very common theme over the last few years that all of us have experienced across different regulators is last minute submissions and provision of material. Uh, rarely, if ever, is there proper tactical advantage to be gained uh, by late service of material. Uh, we know that the, the reality of many of these hearings is that panels, uh, legal advisors, legal assessors and the like uh, read material and in our exper experience comprehensively uh, well in advance of the hearing. Providing material on the day uh, should be avoided at all costs. Tip seven, do not default. And this is one of the themes that seems to be emerging in the High Court cases uh, over the last six months. Uh, we know that regulators, on the whole, have a maximum 18-month period for uh, interim orders. And we also know uh, that, ordinarily, that is the length of order sought uh, by regulators. But, but why? Currently, regulators suggest that COVID backlogs and complexity of uh, particular cases mean that fitness to practice proceedings cannot be concluded within 18 months. That is an assertion which we believe should be challenged. And in our experience of challenging that assertion in recent cases, uh, panels are uh, quite willing to impose shorter interim orders to, to keep on the pressure, as it were, to ensure that matters proceed expeditiously. What is the harm in a shorter order? Often, uh, there is none. Often they can be extended. Of course, there are cost consequences, uh, but we believe uh, that time should be considered in each specific case. Tip eight ties into this and requesting reviews. Once an interim order is imposed, that is not the end of the matter, hence the name. But you don't have to wait until a final substantive hearing to do anything about it. All regulators are under an obligation to review when asked. If there is a change of circumstance in the hearing, either because new evidence has come to light, or because complaints have been made, or, or because there have been uh, adverse case to answer determinations, or all of those can and we believe should trigger proper review of interim orders. And uh, neither regulators nor defence practitioners uh, should be scared to ask for an early review. Tip number nine. Again, the imposition of an interim order is not a final step. Delays happen and delays are increasing. They are under scrutiny by the High Court. Uh, but delays don't have to be the status quo. Uh, we know anecdotally that many regulators and many defence practitioners uh, bemoan the lack of correspondence between parties uh, during the investigation and case progression stages of, of the fitness to practice process. Uh, there are easy solutions to that uh, and we believe that defence practitioners and regulators alike should do more to know their contacts, to keep regular contact uh, and to ensure that all parties know at any one time where in the process which can be a complex process at that, a particular case is. And, and proper timetabling and a more hands-on approach to case management, uh, we believe, uh, will result in quicker uh, and ultimately better decisions being made. Uh, finally, then, the theme that has run through these tips is the High Court. Increasingly, the High Court is scrutinising regulators' rationale. Uh, no longer uh, are interim order extensions uh, considered uh, routine. Uh, there will come a point, we believe, in the next 12 to 18 months when the High Court starts to refuse interim order extensions. Uh, and uh, none of us want to be in that position uh, for a regulator of having to explain why uh, matters that we say are necessary for public protection are no longer in place. But equally, none of us from the defence perspective want to face the criticism of having done nothing sooner. And so the theme that runs through uh, these tips is to keep a closer eye and to take advice and to take instructions 
uh, throughout. And those are our top 10 tips uh, on interim orders. And so we'll hand over to our team dealing with preparing for the final hearing. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay, and um, I hope that you can see the slides. If you can't, please do let me know. Uh, these are our top tips um, for preparing for a final uh, hearing and fitness to practice proceedings. Uh, the format we've taken is that uh, I am setting out those five top tips uh, in respect of defence practitioners and my colleague Shakina will deal with five top tips um, in respect of presenting officers. Um, you can see on the screen now my five top tips for defending and um, engage the client from early um, ask the client to provide meaningful reflection using one of the uh, recognized models think about defense witnesses dealing with facts or general positive character or competence evidence scrutinizing the evidence and looking at how the charges have been drafted uh, what i'd particularly like to focus on um, from those five tips are uh, tip one engaging the client from early on in the process um, and tip four, scrutinising the evidence. Um, a, a common theme which uh, comes out in my practice is the significant benefit to be derived from engaging uh, clients in fitness practice proceedings as early as possible. Uh, that might sound trite and it might sound like a very common sense uh, and immediately obvious tip, but there are very, very obvious benefits uh, to doing so. Um, first, it means that any witness statement which is to be drafted on behalf of the uh, lay client can be as detailed and full as possible. Um, and uh, picking up on a theme to echo uh, what my colleague James said a minute ago, uh, there is increasingly little benefit to serving a witness statement on behalf of the registrant uh, at the last possible second, serving it earlier in the process and giving uh, the panel an opportunity to properly consider that um, is increasingly, in my view, invaluable. And so engaging the client from early on means that you have the opportunity to sit there with the client, talk them through the allegations, talk them through their background, their clinical competence and their practice, and get all that down on paper as early as possible. And it's important as part of that statement that you do cover off those points kind of around the allegations. It, it seems to me very sensible to have a set of uh, written uh, points within the witness statement which cover off each of the allegations in turn, even if that's uh, a lengthy process given the um, contents of the allegations, which can be, uh, I know, in many regulatory proceedings quite lengthy. Uh, but it's also very useful to have background, um, how the person came to be in their clinical profession, uh, how they specialise, what courses they've done, uh, and all that type of information. Uh, but, but engaging early also gives you the advantage in respect of considering uh, the distinction and approach between um, investigatory committee or case examiner stages in the substantive hearing. At a investigating committee or case examiner stage, you may uh, set out a series of submissions and support it with a witness statement which frame a case in one way. Uh, by the time you get to final hearing, you might want to finesse that because further evidence has emerged or the way that the regulator puts their case has changed slightly. Knowing the pitfalls and the risks of changing that approach and, and whether or not those matters are likely to be matters which come before the regulator at the later stage or not are things that you can only identify by bedding in early with the client and having a detailed conversation with them about their position on the evidence. 
um, that goes double for the position where previous allegations have been uh, denied or admitted and then the reverse is the case down the line. And it's obviously vitally important that you understand the four corners of any registrant uh, case at the final stage of the hearing because it, there is a very high chance that that might differ in, in my experience from what was set out at the earlier stages because of the difference in evidence because the regulators have gathered new statements or, or framed things in a wholly different way. Uh, touching on the second uh, top tip very briefly, asking the client to provide meaning or full reflection, that ties into that first point, uh, picking up on a theme from the IOs, uh, at matters which both James and Silas mentioned a moment ago, having a track record of good, engaged mitigation, uh, proof of CPD, proof of reflection, particularly amongst regulators like the NMC, where uh, those reflection forms uh, exist pre-constructed and were to be filled in um, can be increasingly invaluable. And of course, uh, given the uh, increased view of uh, duty of candor guidance produced by regulators like the GMC and the NMC, that's only going to get more important with time. Um, touching briefly on the third, defence witnesses. Uh, it, it's self-evident that defence witnesses, which go to the heart of the defence, so experts, those dealing with clinical matters, uh, need to be uh, explored early. Um, it's important also to reflect, and I'll touch on this a little bit more when I'm dealing with scrutiny of the uh, regulator's evidence in a second, but it's important to distinguish between those people who can give some evidence as to a registrant's general competence within their field and someone who perhaps is actually giving proper expert evidence uh, about the specific allegations uh, before uh, the regulator and discerning which of those two approaches you need to take again comes back to that first tip of engaging the client early on it may be that they have bosses managers within the uh, within the nhs or their own employer who can give good evidence about what's to be expected but but for them to go any further than that might risk straying into evidence which they should or can't or cannot give um, character and competence evidence by by contrast requires only one significant point of finesse in my experience um, general positive character evidence is something which all of the regulators now tell us should uh, be focused primarily after proceedings have been concluded at the sanction stage and say uh, mirroring criminal proceedings uh, statements which say uh, that the, the registrant is a, a otherwise good character or is a good person is all material which is vitally important to the panel uh, here but probably not during the currency of the proceedings. Uh, by contrast, uh, and this is a, a somewhat nuanced point, evidence from character witnesses who actually go into the registrants or registered persons particular competence at their job may be evidence which the panel should be giving proper regard to at the impairment stage. That is obviously going to be relevant to the question of whether they are currently impaired um, notwithstanding the background of the allegations through which the panel are viewing uh, the uh, fitness practice of the registrant before them, uh, whether or not they're impaired now depends much on what their current clinical competence is and, and statements from managers or, or colleagues who talk about that competence will obviously be relevant uh, and should be gathered and be before the panel uh, before any sanctions proceedings. Uh, scrutinising the evidence. Uh, this is uh, a particularly significant point uh, when it comes to preparing a, a case for uh, defending a registrative fitness to practice proceedings. Uh, statements gathered during the currency of investigations by regulators can cover uh, a wide range of incredibly complex subjects. Uh, whilst the allegations may be factually simple, we all know that they can be incredibly factually complicated and depend broadly on very, very complex uh, medical matters. And the reason I invite you to particularly scrutinise the evidence uh, is because uh, as a result of gathering that evidence, there are particular um, issues which we as defence practitioners should be flagging with the regulator as early as possible to try and get that evidence which shouldn't be before the tribunal removed. So what type of evidence am I talking about? Well, those of us who practised in um, regulatory proceedings know that cases like in any way deal with the fact that previous decisions from within a trust shouldn't be 
within a final hearing bundle because it, it, it's entirely improper uh, from a fairness standpoint for the panel's decision to be based on the decision from those within the trust. Uh, but the second decision in MUA number two, which came some time later, uh, gives us an extra steer, and that's evidence which strays significantly into the question of um, reaching conclusions about someone's actual demeanour, but need to be carefully scrutinised as well. What does that mean practically? Well, if you have a witness uh, and that witness is saying something like, I spoke to the complainants on the day, uh, and to me, they seemed very upset and, by, and bothered by what had happened. Uh, that's the kind of thing that an MUA says shouldn't be included. Saying that that, uh, that witness saying that the complainant was uh, visibly upset because they were crying or appeared to shake or was silent are all matters which it, it's perfectly reasonable for a panel to hear. But reaching conclusions about the state of mind of the complainant uh, it isn't evidence which should be before the panel and we should be particularly alive to it. Uh, hearsay too is evidence which is regularly uh, admitted uh, in regulatory proceedings, but there, uh, as those of us who practice in the field know, are still bars. Uh, recent authorities, including that of El Karut, uh, tell us that, of course, uh, hearsay uh, still where the evidence is the sole and decisive allegation, in uh, uh, sole and decisive evidence in respect of an allegation shouldn't routinely be admitted, and we need to be live to that when we're preparing the case. Um, the other matter, which I touched on uh, earlier, is that distinction between expert evidence, proper expert evidence, and evidence which is being given by someone who is in a position to assist the panel with something, uh, but isn't giving neutral expert evidence. Civil authorities uh, from the commercial court, like Multiplex, uh, have given regulating um, bodies a bit of a steer about how that distinction should work. Uh, but realistically, it, it's not uncommon for witnesses to stray into matters which are arguably uh, expert evidence uh, and using those authorities which are before um, the regulatory tribunals uh, based on those commercial court decisions uh, allows us as defence practitioners to close the door on that kind of evidence and make sure it's not before the panel. Uh, so too for redactions. There is bound to be material within the bundle which, uh, as a result of some of those matters I've touched on, all more general data protection matters all properly to be redacted. And dealing with those early, getting them boxed off and agreed, can save you not only a headache at the final hearing, but also mitigate uh, a significant amount of uh, lost uh, time in a hearing. Uh, and finally, very briefly, touching on uh, looking how the uh, allegations have been drafted, uh, be alive to the fact that the evidence uh, doesn't necessarily always mirror um, the allegations. Uh, the allegations, the evidence don't necessarily always match up. But be careful as a defence practitioner about flagging that too early because authorities uh, such as Dory uh, tell us that, of course, uh, regulators have fairly broad powers to vary them uh, as they go. I'll now hand over to Shakina, who will give you uh, preparations for uh, presenting. Thank you. Um, so in relation to the five top tips, if you're case presenting for a regulator, um, the first one, um, I'll just wait for the slides to change. Yeah. So the first one in relation to getting a good handle on the evidence from early on, um, it of course, it's stating the obvious, but I think it can't be underestimated how important it is to properly understand the case that you're putting forward for the regulator and also understanding the evidence and how you'll navigate that when you present a case. Um, in these sort of proceedings, there's often quite complex medical evidence, medical notes, medical terminology, um, drug names that are hard to pronounce. So it's important to familiarize yourself with these so that you at least have a basic understanding of it and that you're able to navigate your papers and assist the panel with understanding um, the evidence. Um, also making sure that you consider a number of core documents as part of your preparations. For example, um, the case examiner's decision um, will set out the background. It will also set out which regulatory concerns have been forwarded to the um, final hearing because um, at referral stage, a number of matters may be raised and at some point it may be decided that some aren't within the regulator's remit. So it's important to understand the background and what is and isn't being considered. Um, also um, looking at 
the, the bundles, um, the notice documents, um, which charges have been put forward, and any responses from um, a registrant, which will allow you to um, understand their defence, um, the case that they're going to be putting forward. And um, you, you've heard about um, interim orders um, in terms of preparing for a substantive hearing, although you don't rely on these for the substantive matter, it does provide a lot of useful information, especially in relation to updates since the referral and um, any risks that have been identified in relation to this registrant's practice, which could assist with submissions at later stages of the substantive hearing, such as misconduct, um, impairment and sanction. Um, and just briefly in relation to the different stages, they're not necessarily as fixed as um, the rules seem. For instance, in the fact stage, there may be some evidence that touches on misconduct. Um, so it's important to make sure that you're um, familiar with what evidence you have and how it, it assists at the different stages. Um, because for instance, you may want to cover certain points um, that you will then rely on later on. Um, in relation to the second tip, um, preparing a detailed evidence matrix. Um, the reason I've included this is just in my experience, this is a very useful and persuasive tool which assists the panel in following the evidence, especially in complicated cases, but it also helps you get your head around the evidence. And it, in my experience, has helped with um, how I will form closing submissions and also legal arguments as they arise. Um, for example, I had a case where um, I successfully opposed the submission of no case to answer by relying on this comprehensive document which identifies where there's key evidence that will support a charge. So um, when it comes to, you know, the evidence, especially where it's complex, having it set out in a way that's easy to digest really does help the panel um, you can take them to it when you do make your closing submissions and again as I mentioned it's very persuasive when you need to then um, explain why the charges have been proven to the relevant standard. Um, the third tip speaking to your witnesses in advance of them giving evidence. Um, this is important because of course in terms of from the regulators position you want your witnesses to give the best evidence that they can um, and ensuring that they're familiar with their witness statement and exhibits assists in doing that. Um, ensuring that they've received the papers and that and checking whether or not there's anything that they need to change or anything that they'd want to clarify or um, identifying for yourself anything that needs to be um, clarified further. Also, explaining the process and managing their expectations puts them at ease and allows them to give better evidence which will of course assist you in your role um, as as a presenter um it when it when it comes to to, to them giving their evidence and it's exploring the different um areas in issue um also it's been touched on earlier about the time it takes for matters to reach a final hearing. And I think it's quite important as a case presenter and from the um, regulator's perspective to reassure witnesses that of course, it has been a long time. And um, even with that being the case, explaining what their role is, what their function is in these proceedings and reminding them that they're, they're not there to fill gaps or guess what happened. Um, it's it's just the nature of these proceedings that they do take a long time to reach a final hearing. Um, and although these may seem like quite small um, ways of dealing with a witness, I, in my experience, it does make a big difference to the quality of the evidence that a witness will give. Um, it puts them at ease and it allows them to give their best evidence, which is what you need um, to properly um, present um, the case on behalf of the regulator. In relation to the fourth tip, um, identifying issues that are alive at the start of the hearing, there are a number of things that will arise on the first day of a substantive hearing. And it's important to, if you can get ahead of it in your preparations, but be prepared for it if it does pop up on the day. So for instance, um, service, although it can be quite a routine matter, 
it's important to scrutinize the papers and check the dates um, to ensure that notice is effective. Um, and if there is anything that doesn't seem quite right, check in whether or not um, a registrant or their representative has agreed to short notice as they are able to waive um, the 28 day requirement. Um, another issue that can arise on the first day of a hearing that is always good to prepare for is um, whether or not there are matters that need to be dealt with in private rather than at a public hearing and making the relevant application. For instance, if there needs to be any exploration of a registrant's health or any other personal circumstance, which shouldn't be on the um, public um, platform. Um, considering special measures, whether there is anything um, that a witness has indicated they would be assisted by in order to give their evidence. This is usually dealt with in advance of a hearing, but of course um, on, on the day, it may be something that is raised and does need to be um, applied for um, at the substantive hearing. We've heard some, um, we've, we've heard a bit about redactions um, from the defense perspective, um, but of course it, it, it goes both ways and in terms of from the regulator's perspective, it being selective with what should be and shouldn't be redacted, ultimately, as long as it's fair and relevant, then it, it is admissible. Um, but of course, treading carefully to make sure that the documents are properly redacted, that there aren't any um, um, matters that shouldn't be included, for instance, anything that hasn't been um, forwarded as a regulatory concern. And also, um, as mentioned earlier, that there aren't any third party findings as these aren't admissible and should be redacted. Um, so just ensuring that there is fairness of proceedings by redacting any additional information, if it may have been missed, um, or if in your opinion, it, sh it shouldn't be in the bundle. Um, in relation to um, another issue that sometimes arises, um, for example, offering no evidence, um, consider whether or not there are any, there's any evidence that has changed since um, the case examiners found a case to answer, but bearing in mind that there isn't scope in um, professional discipline proceedings to negotiate the charges or um, the admissions or denials that are made, but bearing in mind that it's an application that is made, it's an invitation for the panel to exercise its discretion to dismiss a charge, and um, that it's a last resort um, measure that is taken, um, usually at the outset of a hearing um, before charges are read. And the reason that this is done is to avoid a panel having to recuse itself at a later stage if possible. Um, but there is case law that touches on this. The case of X um, um, goes into this in, in detail and, and sets out that um, such applications should be made at the start of a hearing um, and that it, it, it shouldn't be um, a given. It should be properly considered by a panel if um, this measure is being um, exercised by um, the regulator. Um, we, you've also heard a bit about hearsay evidence um, and, in, and in these proceedings hearsay isn't um, inadmissible for being hearsay in and of itself um, but again ideally this is the sort of application that should be made up from the outset um, the case law advises this um, the case of El Karut which was mentioned earlier said that hearsay should be dealt with as a preliminary, um, preliminary issue um, and it shouldn't just be considered on its weight the panel should be deciding firstly whether this evidence is admissible, um, i.e. whether it's fair and relevant, and then secondly, how much weight to place on um, hearsay evidence. And in terms of the relevance of evidence, that goes down to simply, does it go to the charge? Um, but in terms of the fairness of evidence, making it um, admissible, the the case presenter should be um, preparing to rely on um, the principles identified in the case of Thornycroft and the NMC, um, which identify seven principles um, which a panel should consider when deciding on the fairness of um, evidence. And then um, finally, in terms of issues that may arise at the start of a hearing, 
Um, when a registrant is unrepresented, this of course poses um, difficulties as um, more likely than not, they are unfamiliar with the process, um, unfamiliar with the law. And as the case presenter, um, it, you, you have um, a duty to some extent to ensure fairness throughout the hearing, but doing so without crossing boundaries um, and a way to, to deal with this at the start of a hearing and in preparing for a hearing would be to have an open discussion with the registrant, with the legal advisor, um, and ensure that a registrant understands the process and how they can put their case. But of course, it's not your role to um, put their defense for them or assist them beyond that. But it, 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 it's definitely something that can pose an issue at the start of a hearing and something that a case presenter should be prepared for um, when, when they're preparing for um, a substantive hearing. And then finally, um, seeing how the evidence fits the charges. Um, when witness statements are collected at um, a very early stage in, in these processes, Sometimes it may cover things that aren't that are that are um, not necessarily charged later on. So just ensuring that the statement does reflect the charge. Um, the the charges are usually narrative; they are based off of the witness statements. But what you may find is that um, when you've looked at the bundle and you've considered the statement alongside the exhibit, so for instance, the patient notes that refer to something in a witness statement, um, it might not always fully align with someone's recollection of an event. Um, so just preparing yourself to make sure that this is clarified in examination in chief um, and also considering whether or not amendments need to be made to the charges so that it does properly reflect the evidence um, and so that a registrant can, in, in fairness to them, properly respond to a charge because it's, it's accurate. Um, those are um, the five top tips in relation to from the regulator's perspective. Um, I'll now hand over to um, my colleagues, Laura and Anthony, who will um, give you 10 top tips in relation to the final hearing. Thank you very much, Akina. I'm afraid before we get to Laura's excellent 10 top tips, you're going to have to hear from me um, on recent developments in um, the case law for substantive hearings. So I'm just going to share my screen to bring up my slides for that. Excellent. I hope everyone can um, see that. OK, um, so. Yes, I'm dealing with recent case law over the past year or so regarding um, various aspects of substantive hearings. Uh, I'm going to start with the case of Sawati, and I've, I've included the case citations in the top right hand corner. And I'm afraid if, if you're um, uh, the icons for other um, members of this hearing um, are covering that, you might have to move it. But um, this is really, uh, I'd say, the key case that I'll be dealing with. Um, and it goes to the issue of what I've included in the second bullet point there which is kind of rejected defence, particularly of um, dishonesty or a rejected defence regarding dishonesty charges be an aggravating factor when it comes to the sanction stage. And uh, you'll see that I've outlined what the key considerations are, the first being that a rejected defence of honesty um, is more relevant as a potential aggravating feature where the case concerns an allegation which is intrinsically dishonest. An example of that would be fraud or forgery, as opposed to charges where dishonesty gets tacked on to something else such as um, uh, in, a, in a more clinical context. Um, so the second is uh, resistance to the objectively verifiable is potentially more problematic behaviour and more relevant to sanction than insistence on an object, uh, honest subjective perspective. And thirdly, um, to say someone has not told the truth to the tribunal requires more than simply a failure to admit an allegation. So there's a distinction to be drawn between um, not admitting allegations and um, actually going beyond that and putting forward a positive defence, uh, one that's found to be dishonestly given. And I, in my view, it's important to be aware of all of the considerations that the um, court went through, the High Court went through in that case uh, at different stages. I think in the preparation stage, 
it's relevant on the regulator side, um, particularly when you're looking at sanctioned bids, and it might be worth um, when preparing review documents, et cetera, to include that case within the sanctioned bid to make sure your case presenters are aware of it. Uh, equally, it's relevant um, to the defence side when advising a client on the implications of denying dishonesty charges and the implications of defences um, where it could be found at the end that that defence was dishonestly given and the impact that could have on sanction going forwards, because of course sanction does tend to be one of the key considerations for a registrant themselves in deciding how best to go about defending allegations. Of course it's also relevant to the actual substantive hearing itself when you get to the um, sanction stage, it's important for case presenters to tailor submissions around it and to make sure that that distinction is properly outlined to the panel so the panel don't make any impermissible inferences. Um, and of course is equally um, relevant when defending and resisting sanction again, making clear um, the difference and the distinction. The second case is the GMC and Adoye, um, which is uh, basically a clarification of the Kuzmin case, which I've included there and the, the particular Kuzmin factors, which uh, I hope would be useful um, in when that issue comes up for you in, in just outlining them in short. Um, but really what this case says is that the panels shouldn't be considering the merits of the case, the merits of the allegation, um, when deciding um, whether to draw an adverse inference. Um, really, the case is whether um, the consideration for the panel is whether there's a prima facie case, uh, and therefore I'd recommend that um, focus shouldn't be put on that in submissions when both um, presenting and defending. And of course, um, you should be alive to the panel doing so when they hand down a determination, no matter what side you're on. Um, the next case, this is another um, quite important case, and really is a restatement of the principle of open justice, and uh, essentially says that panels should not be overzealous when it comes to, um, forgive me, regulators should not be overzealous when it comes to redactions. And of course, equally, the registrant should be overzealous when making applications to redact particular um, names, etc. That, of course, has relevance to regulators when preparing cases and when redacting matters and in preliminary hearings, for example, or preliminary meetings with um, representatives when deciding what redactions need to be made. Of course, in the healthcare sector, we're in a slightly different position, particularly when we're dealing with the reduction of patients because patient confidentiality somewhat trumps that consideration. That's an interesting distinction to be drawn between what was a solicitor's disciplinary hearing, an SRA case and um, an NMC case, for example, or GMC. And the next is the case of Ahmed. And that really just restates that um, dishonesty is, is very serious and will always put um, a registrant at the risk of erasure or um, strike off, even where that dishonesty is in a non-clinical setting. And you'll see that despite the doctor's glowing professional record was the wording used by the uh, High Court, um, the sanction of erasure was appropriate considering um, the dishonesty was in job applications. The matter of um, Mohammed, this has a couple of interesting a dicta in it. The first is about versions of events and really what it says is that tribunals are entitled to go off on a flight of fancy and to draw conclusions and to draw narratives that haven't been put forward by either side, but if that's being done, um, the party should be given an opportunity to comment upon it. So if you find when you're reading a determination that the panel have gone off on this flight of fancy, you, you might want to consider this case and make sure that uh, the panel have been advised about it and maybe you're given an opportunity to make any representations. Also there's a useful discussion about um, the standard of proof where there are serious allegations, albeit I think it's a little bit of a woolly dictum because it says that the civil standard of proof doesn't vary but also seems to suggest um, that the more serious an allegation is the less probable it is to have occurred. So um, despite saying the standard of proof doesn't shift, um, perhaps you can conclude that it does when one looks at that. But, but it's worth um, bearing that particular dictum in mind. Um, the next we have is um, Williams and the General Dental Council. Um, and this is a particularly useful case um, for advocates, for case presenters and defence advocates. If you haven't put a particular matter to a witness, um, it does make clear that the rule is more flexible within the civil and tribunal setting. And again, more flexible if an allegation has been put to a witness in advance of the hearing, for example, whether that was put within a case management form, whether that was put at the internal stage, um, the internal investigation, that again can help you if there is any criticism of you. 
um, for not putting certain matters. And then we have Ranga and the GMC, where um, this simply um, restates that the issue of insights less relevant when you're looking at um, public interest grounds in terms of impairment, um, for example, um, conviction cases. Uh, we have this case, um, Commission of Police of Metropolis and the Police Conduct Panel. It's a very long case, that one. Uh, what struck me from that, though, is um, the clear distinction that the court drew between statutory guidance and other guidance, for example, the GMC guidance and the NMC guidance, which might be useful, particularly defending when um, presenters put too much emphasis on guidance. And you may want to um, ask the panel to take a more holistic view. And then we have um, Latif and GMC. Perhaps something that we're all familiar with is a poor quality live link. And indeed, this was from Nigeria and the witness had difficulties understanding English. Um, but despite that, there was no serious procedural or other regularity that um, rendered the, the trial process or the, uh, yes, the hearing process unfair. Uh, and indeed, the court focused on the fact that the tribunal had made allowances and indeed the fact that the defence hadn't objected at the time to what was going on. So that is a particularly um, grave lesson for defence advocates to make sure that objections are made when you feel something's not going right, because um, the court will be the High Court will be less keen to intervene when no objections taken at the time. And th those are the cases I, I try to go through them as quickly as possible, um, but they're, they're all included within the slides. And also we will be adding to our case updaters. Um, some of um, these updaters I've included on the slides here already include the cases that both Silas and I have referred to in our um, presentation to you. So I hope you find those useful uh, and they will be added to in due course. Thank you very much. We're going to hand over to uh, Laura now, who's going to deal with her top 10 tips. Hi everyone, um, I know the time, so I'll try and get through these um, as quickly and efficiently as possible. And hopefully Anthony is going to help me go through the slides. Um, so the first top tip, uh, I've tried to fit them all in the theme of know something. So sorry if some of them are not as good as the other ones, but the, uh, the first one is know your contacts. Um, might seem obvious, but this comes up time and time again know the email addresses and phone numbers of the people that you need to interact with during the course of the hearing. So if you're counsel on the hearing, make sure you know your solicitor's details. Uh, likewise, if you're the solicitor, make sure you know your counsel's mobile phone number. Uh, the second one, uh, again, is something that, that does come up, unfortunately, people being on annual leave. Um, what I would recommend is if you're counsel on a case, send an email a couple of days before the start of the hearing, just to check in. It's, it's a good idea anyway, in case anything's come up. Uh, but if you get a bounce back that somebody's on annual leave, make sure that you know who to contact in their absence. Uh, likewise, if you know that you're not going to be in the office or unavailable at certain times, it's good to communicate with everybody else on the team. Uh, and again, identify who can be contacted to assist with last minute disclosure requests or redactions. Uh, we've had some excellent tips about having everything prepared well in advance. But those of us that do regulatory hearings uh, and those of us particularly that did them in person back before COVID redactions and photocopying on day one of the hearing are always inevitable. Uh, so make sure you know who can help you with those redactions. Uh, the second top tip know your bundles. Um, again, an obvious point, but time and time again, this crops up. Check in advance that the bundles that you are working from are the same bundles that the panel is working from and the same bundle that your opponent uh, is working from. If you're defending, make sure your registrant has the same bundle. Going back to the point about last minute redactions, these consistently happen weeks, days, hours before the hearing. Uh, and so you need to make sure that everybody is, is looking at the same thing. The second one, something which um, I'm not necessarily so great at myself, make sure you mark every single exhibit as you go in line with how the panel is marking it. You don't want to be caught out uh, at your submission on the facts stage with the panel asking you, what you think of exhibit 17a uh, and you aren't quite sure which one 17a is so uh, maybe keep a running table uh, or, or write it on a physical document as you go uh, and you will thank yourself at the end of the hearing the next tip please 
Uh, know your evidence. Um, this one is crucial, particularly if you are case presenting. Um, and it goes back to an earlier point about having a good evidence matrix. Make sure you know where the actual evidence relevant to each charge is uh, and know it by page and know it by paragraph number. The panel will want specifics on the allegations uh, and they will want to know exactly within the documentary evidence where they can find it. So make sure you know it. Uh, there would be nothing worse than a panel asking, what's your evidence in support of that? Uh, and you know it somewhere within your 700 page bundle, but you're not quite sure where. Uh, the next point, identify the exhibits that support or contradict the witness statements. This is another key point. Uh, sometimes a paragraph may refer to an exhibit, but there might be another exhibit referred to somewhere else in the bundle that's equally as relevant. So make sure that you have gone through the entire exhibits bundle, uh, mark up any witness statements that they're relevant to, any paragraphs in those witness statements that they're relative to, and most crucially, any charges that they are relevant to. Uh, and then the final point, we've, we've already touched on the evidence matrix, but to mention it for a third time, particularly if you're presenting, it is your friend. If you are defending, it's an excellent way uh, to rebut the charges and to formulate your closing as to why that evidence hasn't proved those charges. Uh, the next top tip, know your opponent. Um, this really comes from a place of having done um, a number of virtual hearings over the last couple of years. Have contact with your opponent. Uh, if possible, try and figure out who your opponent's going to be before the start of the hearing uh, and discuss boundaries uh, with each other. Discuss if you're happy to uh, text each other, if you're happy to email each other, if you're happy to call each other, exchange mobile numbers, exchange email addresses. Uh, and then the final point there, which, which goes back to an, an earlier point about don't delay giving materials because it simply just delays the whole process. Exchange written submissions with your opponent. Um, I always ex exchange my written closing before it goes to the panel with my opponent. Often that might even be the day before. It gives you then both the opportunity to go back through your own submissions, add in anything further, uh, and effectively it, it just makes the process smoother and easier for everybody. The next top tip, Know how your case is uh, developing. Um, next obvious point, keep full notes um, of the evidence as you go. This is particularly crucial if your case goes part heard. Uh, it also may alert you to the fact that some of the charges need to be amended. Those of us that do these kinds of cases know that charges are amended often left, right and centre. They can be updated at the last minute. If the evidence has come out that something happened on the 26th of July, but it's been charged as the 25th of July, you as the case presenter ought to be aware of that. Try and identify any legal arguments you may need to make as the case progresses. Quite often that will be identifying if, if your case presenting half time submissions that your opponent is probably going to make. Start thinking as the evidence comes out how you might respond to that. If you're defending uh, equally, if not more important, uh, has the evidence come out in the way it was expected? Will it support any submissions that you want to make at half time? Uh, and then the final point uh, on this slide, think about the later stages. Um, we know with regulatory hearings that there's a number of different parts that we have to uh, go through before the case concludes. Did the evidence come out in such a way that perhaps a strike off is no longer appropriate and, and you may want to take instructions that actually it, it's come out at a level where a suspension order may be appropriate. So simply have on your radar the next stages that you need to go through. Top tip number six, uh, know your instructions. Um, quite often people can be frightened to say to the panel, I, I need a break, I, I need to make a call. But it's really, really important that if you have got uh, questions that you need to run through with the rest of your team, you have the time to do that. If something out of the blue comes out, if a witness says something you weren't expecting, do ask for time. Uh, again, the second point here, take note of oral instructions uh, that you receive from your solicitors. If you're the solicitor side, make a written note of conversations you've had with counsel uh, and then confirm them in writing. It makes life a lot easier for you um, and it makes it easier to, to justify why certain things have happened in the hearing.
Top tip number seven, uh, know your registrant. So um, this is if you are defending. Same point um, I've made in respect of um, know your solicitor's contact details. Make sure if you are defending, you know how to contact your registrant. Again, discuss the boundaries. Will you be having a meeting uh, in advance of each day? Will that take place on Zoom? Will that be a phone call? What time will that be at? Don't be afraid to ask for time to take instructions from your registrant. They are the most important person in the hearing. Identifying in advance whether your registrant may need breaks. Uh, sometimes people will say my concentration is not good in the afternoon. Sometimes people will have a, a medical concern. So make sure that you're fully aware of the needs of your registrant. Again, they are the most important person in the hearing. Uh, and this final one, keep an eye on the registrant. If you can see that they're getting tired, ask for time. If you can see that they look confused, don't be afraid to intervene and say, I'm not sure the registrant understood that question. Could it be rephrased, please? Top tip number eight, uh, know your instructing solicitor's expectations. Um, so from the solicitor side, know your own expectations, I suppose that would read. Um, at the end of each day, give on any information to the rest of the team that is required, keep everybody updated with what's been going on, particularly confirm any decisions that have been taken, always let everybody know when the panel have gone out at the fact stage, have a discussion about the misconduct and impairment stage, uh, and then have a conversation about the sanction stage. Keep in mind when things have happened over the course of the day that may impact the timetable of the case. Top tip number eight. I'm not sure if this should have read number nine. Uh, know your environment. Um, identify in advance how you will conduct the hearing. Uh, and the reason I say this again goes back to the virtual hearings that we've all had. I only recently discovered how beneficial it was to have a second screen. If you're going to have a second screen, set it up in advance, make sure it works. Do a test to make sure that if you are using a second screen, you're not awkwardly looking off into the corner somewhere. Make sure that um, actually you are engaging with the hearing and you're using the right screen for the video call. If you're working on pen and paper, make sure you have enough paper, make sure you have a working pen. Uh, and identify in advance how the notes that you are taking are going to lead in to your final submissions. So, for example, if you are taking a full note of someone's evidence, it's much easier to then copy and paste that directly into your submissions on the fact stage. If you decide you want to write in pen and paper, underline the key points, put asterisks next to them. Uh, so effectively, just, just know your own methods and how that's going to work for you. Next top tip, number nine, uh, know your result. Um, this one, I, I think I tried to rather fit into the know your theme and it didn't really work, but there we are. Um, don't be afraid to consider the final decision of the tribunal. Um, quite often you'll get a lengthy decision at the fact stage. Some panels may say, let's move on. You need to have time to properly consider the reasoning. It will feed in naturally into the next stages of the proceedings. It's very, very helpful for panels if you can quote the panel themselves when you are making submissions. Discuss the final decisions uh, with the rest of the team that's working on the case with you. Identify any issues with, with sanction uh, and discuss any issues that arose over the course of the hearing to learn lessons for the future. What worked well, what didn't work well. And then the final one, know your next steps. Um, more and more, we're finding that cases are having to go part heard. It's normally because of technology. Uh, just make sure that you've discussed all eventualities uh, and that you know if you need to ask for certain dates to be avoided, identify whether you need to make an interim application at that stage and crucially keep everybody updated on the point that you have reached Keep a good note. Um, it's always good to go back and reflect upon what stage of the hearing you've got to so that when you pick it up in three, four, five months time, uh, you can re-familiarise yourself with it quickly. So that's my very quick uh, 10 top tips. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm going to pass back over now to James. Thank you, Laura. And thank you to all of my colleagues who have uh, spoken this evening. Uh, that draws the talks to an end. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that we're not going to have many questions uh, given the time, but please do feel free to contact any of the speakers.
uh, if you have any questions arising from uh, the talks this evening. Anthony mentioned uh, earlier, uh, and I repeat, that our Mountford Chambers case up data uh, will be sent around in, in the coming weeks, uh, and that will be a, a document containing all of the case law updates uh, in professional discipline from 2022, uh, a little uh, Christmas present, if you will. Uh, there will also be an article series in the new year, uh, and we look forward to sharing that with you. Uh, finally, then, it remains to thank those of you who have attended uh, this talk uh, and the autumn seminar series, uh, either in person, by Zoom, or, or those of you who are watching this uh, online. Uh, thank you for your support, uh, and we wish you uh, a very happy winter. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>